Welcome to a new episode of Carolyn Talks. I am your host, Carolyn Hines, and this is the podcast slash YouTube channel where I talk to film creators about their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today, I am joined by filmmaker and animator Wei Lee to talk about his film, Tehu, which showed at the 2022 Toronto Real Asian <laughs> International Film Festival. And this is an animated film. It's a short film, um, but it's one that I actually relate to a lot. As you guys know, I am Barbadian. I'm from the Caribbean. And while the film is set in Tahiti, in which is otherwise known as French Polynesia, there are some cultural similarities and the story that he's telling that I'm, I related to a lot and something that I speak about in my work as a critic. So I can't wait to talk to we about this. But before we begin, as usual, I'd like to have my guests say a bit about themselves and what got them involved in filmmaking and in his case and animating as well. So wait, thank you so much for joining me. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you. So tell me, how did you start out being an animator? Yeah, you know, earlier we were having a little chat and you were telling me about your previous career and your education and you completely diverged. It's similar for me too. I, wow. I went to business school and I, I got my um, degree as well, but never pursued it. I don't have it hung up on my wall because I, I didn't even go and collect it. I was so like, oh, screw this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, throughout business school, I was just drawing a lot. And initially, I was after graduating, I actually started doing comics on my own and mm -hmm. self-publishing. But then eventually, I realized that I really needed to learn how to draw if I wanted to pursue this seriously. And so I went back to um, school for animation just for two years, initially just to learn how to draw. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's an animation industry here in Vancouver. So it was something that you can get a job in that, you know, I kind of like, you know, drawing. So that's kind of how I got into, into animation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And were there, was there like any particular style of animation that you're drawn to? Because for like Tahura, the um, animation style is very distinct. It's not like very typical, like the lines are very fluid, uh, which I think kind of mimics the dance that's, um, that's done in the, in the film is, um, I think it's Otea. Um, so it's a traditional um, Tahitian dance. And like, I love how you like use the animation to tell that line of the story as well so was that as is that a style that you've used before and is it one that you were drawn to or is it just one that you picked specifically to tell this story so um i'm actually not an animator before this film i didn't animate except oh, really? learn, yeah except to learn how to animate in school i didn't work in, as an animator i worked mainly as a storyboard artist ah Okay. Yeah. But wait, and isn't technically storyboarding also animation? Or is there is no. there a distinction? There's a very there's a very big distinction. Could you explain it? <laughs> <laughs> so storyboarding is I take the script and I essentially determine the cinematography, um, the mm -hmm. staging, how the whole film's gonna look. Um, I draw it out first without animation. Mm. Um and then and then it's then sent to the animators. And if it's 3D, they use the assets to animate it. If it's 2D, even nowadays, there are still 2D assets that they use to animate based on the storyboards. So yeah, it's quite quite different. But there is, you know, as, anim as storyboarding becomes more and more um, competitive, if you will, uh, there are people who pretty much animate in their storyboards, which is a, a ton of work. And that, you know, seep a little bit into into my work so it did get me thinking a bit more about animation but in terms of like actual animating i i didn't do it until um this film and to answer your question is there a particular animation style oh man that's a hard one um i i suppose there are some more independent or yeah I guess one one film that comes to mind is um, my neighbor, yeah, the Yamatas, which is not an independent film. It's a Ghibli film from the '90s, and I just love the the mark making they used in the film. In the sense that they, you know, it's it's not cleaned up. The lines are not cleaned up. It's very 
you can see the brush strokes. You can、mm. see the animator's hand. You can see the artist's hand. And I I really like that quality, especially for moments in my film where it is about、um, her relationship with her art form. You know, her relationship with how the dance feels. And I I love that like sense of imperfection in the brush strokes.、Um, and it. It's you know it's not the polished、mm. and performative type of work we see on the stage when the dancers are、um, performing for the audience. Rather, it, it's you know when I was in Tahiti and I was、um, trying to understand and learn more about the dance and the culture. It's more when they're practicing that really drew me in、uh, because you you really see the humanity when someone's trying to. Get better, trying to perfect something, you know. And so,、um, yeah, it's it's that that influenced the the style of dance as well as the style of animation. Right. Okay. So before we get there, so storyboarding is more static art, while the animation is the is the movement and 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 the art becoming alive. Okay. You know, for some reason, I've always thought of storyboarding as a type of animation, but it's not. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um. So, like talking now about Tahirua, um, like I love like when you say that that it's not perfected. I love that aspect of the film because it's very raw, and it that and there is the there is a beauty in it being unfinished because. It fits the story that's being told because, like for Tehudo, te- there is moments like in the second half of the film where she be like she is becoming raw. She's not doing the perfected dance of the practice movements of someone who's just performing just because this is her job. Once she、exactly. starts to really tap into her um her artistry and her culture and her history, it becomes the brush like the rawness fits, especially when you talk when it becomes about the storm too. But before、mm-hmm. we get there, you talked about learning um about Tahiti and the culture and and the dance that will take us. So talk. So why did you choose this to be the story that you would tell for your first um animated film? Like what what was it that drew you in? About the dance and about the culture that said that you said this is what I want to tell this this is a story I want to tell first. Yeah, so I mean, initially it was a very naive and kind of boring origin story. I, I just really wanted to make a short film,、um, and then my friend suggested the setting in French Polynesia, and I love dance, so I was just like, oh, what would that kind of look like? But as、uh, As I start to research into it and look into、um, that dance culture, I, I realized I couldn't approach such a story without addressing Orientalism and without addressing my own male gaze and without addressing the body politics. And it, you know, it's not just that it fascinated me, but it's more that it challenged me and my worldviews to, to such a degree that I. You know, I couldn't let it go as a story, but I also knew that not being、um, T- Tahitian and not being a female dancer, you know, there was a question whether I should tell the story at all.、Mm. And so that's why I decided to go to Tahiti to answer that question. And I was prepared to come back, realizing I shouldn't tell the story at all. <laughs> so I emailed a bunch of dance chiefs, dancers, and schools. I didn't know anyone in Tahiti. I went, and to my surprise,、um, you know, everyone was. It wasn't that they were just so generous. It's that they really welcomed me with the attitude and the the philosophy of how they approach art and community as intrinsically linked, and they really provided me with so much. Um, unconditional support. That at the end, I felt like I had to finish the film to reciprocate what they, what they gave me.、Mm. Or else、so、when, I would be a lie, you know. Yeah. So, so when you got there and you were talking with them and you told them, um, like you, you as you said, you you didn't first initially have the idea of telling it from the aspect of colonialism and talking、mm-hmm. about the the culture and the history of the dance and what it symbolizes, especially for the female dancers. When you told them your perhaps your original idea, and then the, as the as the story starts to evolve, and you start to say, "Okay, this is what I want to make it about." What was their response to you, and what what did their they share about their own、um, experiences? Like, were any of them also dancers at resorts, like Tahura is in the film? Yeah. So、um, when I went, I already had the idea of、um, addressing 
Orientalism and and the male gaze and whatnot. Um, and it's funny because, you know, there's a language barrier. I don't speak French, and uh, over there is predominantly French. And the, to the degree that, like, the second time I went to Tahiti, I brought a friend who would translate for me. But the first time I went, um, I went to the school. Uh, it's called a Conservatoire um, de Polynesia. And it, anyway, the Conservatoire, I was talking to the director, and his English wasn't that great. And so he thought, he actually thought my film was a love story. He thought it was the exact opposite of what I was going for. He, he yeah. thought it was about a tourist learning to, like, falling in love and that it was going to be a love story. And so that's how he told my project to one of the art teachers there. Okay. <laughs> and then within five minutes of meeting that art teacher, he invited me to stay with him um, at his place. And, of course, I was very thankful because... Yes. And and so I, I went and stayed with him and he... He shared this with me. He, he thought that it was about, like, it was an Orientalist lens. That's what he thought. He was so relieved when he realized my, my true intention. Um, and he's a dancer himself. And so we would spend, you know, nights talking about what it means to be um, French, uh, what it means to be Tahitian, contemporary Tahitian, and what it means to live, you know, with this colonialist history. He told me stories of, you know, his grandmother hanging up posters of the nuclear blasts on their yeah. coasts that the French government would give them as a, as a as a propaganda piece of like you should be proud of this. You should be proud of what your country offers to, to the world. The great. The ah. Yeah, and um, so yeah, what he told me really influenced my my lens of Tahiti and you know when I when he realized what my project was about he said you have to make this because we don't have a story like this and you know that's something that stuck with me um and later on I met a a dancer who eventually became a, my choreographer and she told me her whole relationship with the Tahitian dance um, from a, from being a little kid because her mother was a dance teacher was a, mm -hmm. was a professional dancer and so she yeah so the choreography how it worked was it kind of based on her life story how she you know was taught a dance that was very rooted in in um, Tahitian traditions and then later she, you know, was a rebellious teenager and went against all that and joined something that was more about um, showing the world much more performative and wanting to, you know, be big and grand and modern. And she did that, but then she realized there was this, for lack of a better word, like individualism mm. to that group. And so she left it and went back to her old group where she reconnected with her roots and so i took kind of that life story of hers and um wrote wrote, wrote it in poetry form and asked her if it spoke it, it felt true to her and she said yes and i asked her if she could choreograph something that tells this story of hers and then that's how we that was like the foundation of the choreography Mm. We'll get to the choreography um, mm. in a bit, but I want to start. Um, you mentioned something there about the like the French government's handing out the pictures of the um, the atom bomb exploding. Because for people who don't know, so like <laughs> just before uh, while they were testing the uh, the first set of atomic bombs, like in in French Polynesian in that part of the Pacific Islands, there is Bikini Atoll, as most people know it for, where they tested the um, atom bombs before dropping them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, and the islands were devastated for like dozens of years because of the effects of the um, of the fallout. So just to think that the French government, a colonialist government, because we know what they've done to, to um, Haiti and other, uh, and other um, countries in the Caribbean 
and around the world where they handed out propaganda in the form of pictures of the bomb exploding and said, this is your sacrifice. We and the people didn't sacrifice themselves. You know, it was the governments like the Euro European and the Amer North American governments, America, who did the bomb testings and they were like sending out and saying, Oh, you did that. You you guys sacrificed, and this is a, a good for the people. I'm like, no. So like, just to think that they that they did that, I can't imagine like having that as a as 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 a part of your history. Where it's one thing that it happened, but then for the government to propagandize, I I had no idea. This. So you mentioned it as the first I've ever heard of that even being done. But like the fact that I know that I fully believe. Because like we've seen how it's happened in other countries and how imperialism is propagandized and spread and spread as this the thing when we, especially for a lot of people of color, know that the effects of imperialism, especially Western imperialism, is it blows my mind, honestly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I can't imagine the anger. Because <laughs> like the anger does come through mm. the film a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, there were so many so many stories like that that were, were told to me it was hard to like pin it down it, of course there were parts of me that's like oh that's such a you know maybe i should more of the story to t include that but there's there's so much and i you know at some point i just had to focus on just the one part of what um what i learned over there yeah mm. If you already include that, you probably have to make it into a feature film. <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. just so much. And so like, and I mentioned the anger now. So talk, I want you to talk a bit about, we will get to, as I said, the animation stuff. Actually, no, let's do it. Because the animation style, as I said, it it they, it it had a very specific feel to it, especially with the music, the way how at first it starts. So so Tehura is, she's a dancer and she's on a, in, um, at a resort. And so she's performing there at night and there's these two white guys. And they're like, you're, and you talked about the male gaze, like for them, her her body, the, the bodies of the dancers are just there for their entertainment. They're just broken down. They're just seen as like either hips or breasts or arms or legs. And they're not like looking at the full the full body of the performers or just like the performance itself. It's about um, the commercialization and the sexualization of um, culture and how that and how... Um, not only imperialism, but especially particularly um, Western um, sexual sex, hypersexualization of women of color in particular plays a big part in how culture has been commodified and commercialized by other countries. So like I mentioned um, before we began recording, I'm from Barbados. So in the Caribbean, especially and in Barbados, like our culture has become very commercialized in an, in a way where it's meant it's almost it's almost like an export product for us. So like we have, um, so like when tourists come to the islands, they come to be entertained by by our by our, by the people. They come to be entertained by Bajans. They come to be they they at the hotels. You have like the performance nights where you have local dance troops and drummers and musicians come in and they perform our culture for these people for the entertainment of these people. And what they what these tourists don't understand or they don't care to understand or to know is that the songs that are being sung, the dances that are being danced, the music that's being played all tell very specific stories and a lot of them tell stories about our culture mm -hmm. and our history and our people. But they don't care about that. They just care for the to be entertained. And Tahura talks about that where she and the other women are they're telling stories in their dance like for a lot of people think that for the otea dances and even the hula dances um in hawaii are just dancing but they don't care that these dances are actually a full language you know they're telling actual stories so um talk about that aspect of the film first and the aspect of this story that you're telling how there's you're telling and the story of um, colonization and um, imperialism within this film and within Tahura's dance itself. Because we, you, I want you to talk first about the commercial dance, the dance performed at the hotel, and then the dance that she does, which is like the breakaway, um, her emotional and just like she, her emotional breakaway, she just fed up and she's like, I can't do this anymore. Um, so talk a bit about those two, uh, the, those two sides of the performance within the film. Yeah. Um, so... You know, actually, it's interesting because 
when I was in Tahiti, I also visited resorts. I also saw these performances. And it's interesting to me because, you know, it's all very, everyone's very polite. Everyone's very civilized, like all the tourists. And it's more like a, it feels more like a respectable show that's happening while people are eating and then they go and take pictures and it all feels very, you know, the, 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 the sexualization is not explicit in the actions of the audience. Mm. You know, the, the sexualization is really in our minds, right? Through all the marketing, through um, all the imageries that we've associated um, cultures with. And so I found that really intriguing in the mm. sense that like all these tourists came because of those reasons, because of the images they've seen, because of the marketing. And they, they want to partake in this, but really, you know, there's a, a bit of discomfort, right? Of like, of, oh, but I'm a decent human being. I shouldn't, but this <laughs> is what also what drew you here. And so I wanted to make that very explicit, like much more explicit than it is in reality um, in the film. Just because I, uh, I want to see how audience members that would go to a resort like this feel when they see it being more explicitly stated. You know, if the imagery that's put into our heads do play out, what would that look like? For them mm-hmm. and i wanted to make that uncomfortable a lot of people describe the first part of um the the, the tourist perspective as being very cringy which mm-hmm. exactly <laughs> exactly what i'm going for um and and so yeah in terms of even the dance and uh, the way i drew it I, I wanted to be much more graphic but still and still respecting the move, movements and the dance, but without making it um, feel expressive, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, I, I, especially like not expressive with a voice. Yeah, I, I wanted to feel voiceless, I, I suppose. And then for the second part, as I mentioned earlier, it's much more um, influenced by the moments when the dancers are practicing in, in Tahiti because it's in those practices where you really feel the sense of community. You know, when it's a performance, it's about the performance, but it's about executing perfectly. It's not about acknowledging each other. It's about facing the audience and, you know, putting on the smile. Whereas mm-hmm. in, the, in the practices, they're not smiling, you know? Mm-hmm. They're, they're sweaty and they're just going hard at it, but they're also cheering each other on with, um, I don't know what's the right word. They, they do this, this um, calling, mm. which is which, which what um, Teura does right before her final dance to, to signal to the musicians. And it's this almost like battle cry, you know, yeah. to cheer each other and to, to keep going. And, uh, you know, I love the moments where they're, they're taking breaks to drink water, to share snacks and all the families watching. You really get much more of that community sense. Um, and that's why, even though I'm not a big fan of flashbacks in general, I would just want it. It's, it's, I wanted to show a glimpse of that, that sense of practice in the, in a community um, in, you know, that, that, dominated mode of most of her life you know, that should dominate what the dance means to her mm. no that makes sense because that's who she is and that's who these women are and that's how the um community is because at, like the same thing like back home when we're before like, i used to be in a choir too so mm. um and i used to dance when i was in secondary and primary school so mm. when you're practicing that's where you that's how we really are like that's where yeah. you're really community and that's where you hear us talking in our dialect and in our accents and you're not worried about impressing 
the Taurus. We're not worried about executing a perfect performance that reflects positively on on like the group or the hotel that you're playing that you're representing it or whatever concert you're performing at. And I was and and I would say there is also a difference um, when you're performing from my own experience and from women and other people that I've seen as performers in like because I've been to Cuba as well where I stayed at a hotel where like the same thing happened. And there's a very there's a difference between when you're performing in front of your own people, even even if it's just like an actual performance where you're performing in front of your own people versus where you're performing for people who are not of your culture. There's sure. there's there's still that sense of community. There's still that sense of funness because you're at home. This is where you are home. And when you're performing for like tourists, especially who are usually predominantly white, European or American or North American, there's this there's this idea that we have to impress them, you know, that we have to show them that we can be just as perfect or more perfect than they are. And, and, and is this, and I think it's just such a perversive um, psychological effect of, of colonization and colonial, um, colonialism, where we, as people of color, we, we've been conditioned to believe that who we are as, who we are culturally and who we are like ethnically isn't good enough you know that we have to put on this performance we have to like you're talking about like the film talks about that um where like you we're we're we we can't be sweaty we're not supposed to be sweaty you know we're supposed to all perfectly put together and even for these same women for these same dancers even though their their costumes are um their are their traditional wear to other people would seem skimpy quote-unquote like they're still like that's who they are you know they still have to look a particular way in these outfits and is and they're not respected for the outfits having a particular purpose or how the, the outfits re reflect their culture and who they are as a people and so let's say when I watched this film like I I was just like oh I'm like I can really relate to this film because it kind of oh. um <laughs> because it it reminded me of a conversation a thread I had made on Twitter not too long ago where um, this, um, this artist singer, um, she wore, a, a she wore a costume, what, or what we would uh, call a costume for, for carnival, for like, um, and she was saying she would wear it for, um, Halloween. And I remember I made a thread and, and it's about, and it's like, you know, like carnival costumes, particularly like, um, like in Barbados, we, we call it crop over, but it's like, they're, they're skimpy. They're like basically bathing suits with like sequins and feathers and whatever. And, people who aren't from the culture just see it as oh they're, they're just these sexy outfits you know it's just these sexy things and like she's like i'm gonna work for halloween and i made it so like these aren't for halloween carnival yeah. and popover these are not for halloween it's not about rep it's not like representing a pagan religion because halloween came out is like considered a, a pagan um event and i'm like for us for the caribbean for people in the caribbean Carnival and crop over came out of slavery. It was a way, it was how pe Black and slave people were celebrated their freedom, you know? Like, we're at the end of harvest, that's the only time, like, maybe one or two days out of an entire year where they got to play their um, traditional instruments. They got to play their music from across in Africa. So I was very upset. I'm like, you people keep seeing the Caribbean and these cultures as just, like, entertainment. I'm like, these outfits have a meaning to us, you know? The colors, the music, the dance, it has meaning. So that I that yeah. was like legit a couple of weeks before religion. So then when I saw your film, I was just like, oh, this is basically like what I was talking about <laughs> in my thread. Totally, totally. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting to me that, you know, what I understand is that they, the, um, the clothing they wear for the performances have specific meaning. It also does feel like more for, um, for example, they have this event called the, the Heva. They have various yeah. competitions, but the Heva is the biggest one. Mm. And, you know, they, they would spend months making all the costumes, all the outfits for the Heva. And actually, yeah, one of the dance chiefs, um, at one point, I was hanging out with him and I was like helping make some of the outfits so intricate, so much materials. And it does feel like when they're, yeah, like for, for the Haven, when they're performing for each other, 
that sense of history and, and cultural significance of the outfits come out. But at the same time, I, I wanted to, for the purpose of the, the short film, I wanted to get across that the dance is, you know, part of their everyday life. You know, they spend more time dancing in just normal, just modern, regular clothes than they do in the, in the performative outfits. And that, you know, the, the, there's a, a, a every a day-to-day, moment-to-moment meaning behind the dance and what, what role it plays in their life um, beyond how it's embodied in the, in the outfits, you know. I thought that was that that was yeah maybe that that was something that was interesting in in trying to explore Mm -hmm. right and um and and in talking about now the meaning of the dance and the meaning of the costumes let's talk about the meaning of Tehuda's dance because I I interpreted her dance comes across to me as very um it's very emotional and it's very Mm -hmm. to me it it reads also as very angry like she's very mm-hmm. angry and like you can tell she's calling back to her memory Like you mentioned the flashbacks and the flashbacks is of her training and practicing with her um with her group as 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 a young girl and she's watching the elders um they're dancing they're inspiring her and teaching her about the co- about the culture and about their history in these dances and she's well while she's performing her her um to me it's like a dance of um reclamation like she's reclaiming her identity mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. tahitian and as a tahitian dancer in these flashbacks she's remembering the practices that she did as a young girl and she's remembering the elders and she's mimicking their that the movements because like the movements are about like calling on their ancestors and calling on their history and it's, and it's inspiring her so talk about just the inter like you as you mentioned like your friend she was the one who i'm um, choreographed this and you loosely based it on her experience so talk about just the emotionality of that, of the dance itself and the choreography, but then um, translating that as an animation, because I just, as I said earlier, I love how raw the animation style is for this. And it's very, it feels very fluid and very natural and the lines of the animation follow that style. So talk a bit about the, just watching the dance and choreographing this as an animator and the challenges, because it could not have been easy. <laughs> yeah, the... The anger, yeah, it's interesting because um, given the emotional narrative of the story in the film specifically, I did feel like it had to start with anger, Mm -hmm. but then it had to transition to something deeper than anger, right? That that something, um, her connection with her community that, that ends up for lack of a better word, at least in that moment, healing her, that, that mm-hmm. sense that, you know, as dancers, sometimes that happens, you know, you might start out because you're, you're angry or you're defiant or you you want to get rid of some kind of feeling. And it, there, there's a, as you go through it, there's a bit of healingness to it. You, you, as you're able to overcome that anger at the end, mm. by the end, right? So I wanted to get that across. And it, it was tricky. And um, it was tricky to, yeah, plan out that arc and to make it convincing to move from anger to to where she is at the end. Um, sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Like, um, so talk about this. Um, the working with the choreographer, um, yeah. she is na- oh my gosh, I have Nahima. to read here, but I can't even read my own handwriting. <laughs> no worries. Nahima. Nice. Uh, working with her, but then also the dancer who plays Tehura. Um, she like work, talk about working with them. Did the two of them uh, work together? Like she would have had to work with um, with her to show her the choreography and everything, right? The dancer, so she she did the dance the the choreographer nahima oh. also did the dance um the the voice of um mm, right. to ura is some, someone else but she didn't need to she's also a dancer but she didn't need to um uh, you know perform the dance for me right. to, to animate it yeah nahima choreographed and did the dance as i um recorded her 
her movements and her dance so that I can reference it. But it was mainly just recorded from one angle. So all mm -hmm. the so it wasn't like rotoscoped or anything. It was all the camera moves and um uh, all the camera moves and different angles, it's all like based on what I came up with. Oh, how you envisioned it from a yeah, how I envisioned it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And um even the s s there are certain parts of like the pacing of her movements and the animation that I um differed from to uh, Nahima's choreography or mm. from her videos at least because I wanted to you know linger in certain poses, speed up in certain poses to further the emo emotionality, but still trying to do it within the parameters of what makes um a dance authentic and, and traditional in the lens of Ori, Te Ori Tahiti. Hmm. And how long did it take you to just um animate that one se just that one sequence alone? Because it's um it's a pretty it's a pretty lengthy sequence. So like how long did you did it take you to start from the first um set of animation from observing the video till the end where you're like, okay, now the film is complete. This is like how long did it take you to do that? So and that was actually one of the first sequences I animated. Mm, okay. Um just because Initially, my reasoning was because it was the most difficult. But it was, I think it's actually because I was most interested in, in doing it. It was the, the scene that, um, yeah, just excited me the most. And I think that's probably why I started animating it first. And while it is very difficult, it was very difficult. It was also the most fun. And so yeah. it didn't, so the difficulty didn't, you know, stick in my mind as much as some of the other scenes. It's the tedious, boring scenes that that really, yeah, was <laughs> felt more draining to me. Whereas this one, it was just more exciting, and the the fact that um, the lines are so rough, and it also get it also makes it more forgiving, right? Mm. And so. And I wanted that feeling of, um, you know, I was trying to channel the feeling that I saw of the dancers practicing, you know, that, that sense of rawness of pushing oneself um, while to not necessarily even towards perfection, but um, beyond the limits, even if it's their flawness to it. And yeah, trying to capture that, that sense of beauty it's it's actually the scenes in the beginning of the film that were a lot harder because it was more about like cleanness and yeah. perfection and is way more tedious than boring yeah um, so talking now about the music because like the music um yeah. by moana urima like that's also another big driving force in the film yes. because the music for that also changes um, from the beginning of the from the first half of the film to the second half where um Tohuru goes into her dance and that's uh that's where you also get the emotionality that's where you feel a lot of the emotion like the anger like it starts out like the, the drums are really intense and they're there you can feel that it's about her anger and I think also a bit of sadness too like you said like there's like a, a bit of healing at the end but there's all like a sadness is also very usually tied to anger as emotion totally. like they're usually very combined and for her in this case is you she's also she's angry but she's also sad about the connection that she lost that she kind of like pulled away from her um her community because there's a very scene as it's one of the few scenes with dialogue where she's um after the first performance she's mm -hmm. in the dressing room and she's talking with um to the other dancers she's like how come we don't dance the way we used to dance when we were kids mm -hmm. you know and the other dancers like it's just a performance and this is also, I think, where because they're speaking in French, because in Tahiti, like the main language is French, not because of um, uh, colonization um, or the annexation, because honestly, and truly, like they never see it. Like French was just like, we claim you now. Um, but they said this is the official language. And that's where it also hits home that the other problem she has with losing touch with her culture is they're speaking in French. They're not spe speaking in native Tahitian. You know, like they've been made to speak a, a language that is not indigenous to their country. So like there's all of these layers and subtext to the story. And that one scene says so much 
about who she mm-hmm. is and who her people are. And like, there are sometimes you feel very isolated if like, like you're, you're if you're a person that's like, I don't like injustice, I want things to change. And then there's other people like, they're not necessarily they're satisfied with status quo, but they've accepted it. They're like, this is just how life is now. This is what it is to be a Tahitian now. And for her, she's like, but we should not be like this. We should still try to keep in touch with our culture, in touch with our history and in touch with our people. And you can tell she feels a bit isolated like that because she's like, why don't my friends, these other dancers feel the same way I do? So that's how, where a lot of the sadness also comes. So mm-hmm. the music plays a big part in translating her emotions as well. So talk about working with the musician and how that ties into you uh, working as an animator. We talked a bit about the dancing. So like talking now, talk now about choreographing the dance to the music because it has to follow the, um, the music. And it also like, this is also something as a storyboard artist, you wouldn't have had to do before like work with music and now you're like I, you're like now I gotta work with movement but I also gotta work with music too yes yeah oh, it was it was very challenging and I was kind of just developing the process as I went um so like I mentioned I, I went the first time and choreographed the dance once but and I came home and I tried to storyboard it and I storyboarded the best I could. And then the second trip, I brought it back to Nahima. Mm. And we looked at it, we discussed it. There was this initial idea of incorporating some um, contemporary dance, like modern dance mm. as well. So make it a bit fusion-y. But then we scrapped that idea when, when I discussed it with Nahima. Just wanted to keep it as authentic to Ori Tahiti dance as possible. And then, uh, so we re-choreographed it <laughs> based on this temp music that she suggested, or she actually referred to me to, to a musician that I talked to and borrowed some music from him. And <laughs> so we re- re-choreographed it. And then I worked with Moana. I showed Moana the dance, the, both the animatic um both the storyboards as well as uh, Nahima's choreography <laughs> and told him the, the story and whatnot. And so he then, he was a one person army. Okay. He, he did all the drums. There were like four or five different mus- musical mm-hmm. instruments. And he would just record each one individually while listening to his previous recording. He mm-hmm. just, he was a whole orchestra. You know, and he did it in like two hours. He was so, so good, so professional. Even the sound engineer was like, whoa, this person really knows what he's doing. And so, yeah, we tried to capture the emotionality. We we, we talked a lot, you know, we talked for like, uh, we spent a, a day talking, just talking about the film and had dinner together just trying to be on the same mindset before the recording session um and then i went back to nahima (laughs) to be like now here's the music Mm. can you perform the choreography to this music then recording it again and then went home and re-storyboarded the whole thing (laughs) it was a whole process (laughs) yeah the whole process um but i think yeah I, i I can't take credit for the emotionality of the music. That was all Moana and, yeah, his no. ability, and his ability to understand what I was going for. You yeah, know, the, the music is beautiful. And um, another aspect of the film where sound is also important is the, there's a lot of quietness in the film. Like there's a lot of, there's um, this is a very short, short film. It's about like 10, 11 minutes long, but, there is very there is moments where like the length you, you it feels like a longer film and this is a good thing because it just lets you sit in the quiet moments of the film like where um like where after she's done her dance um her dance of rebellion and reclamation mm-hmm. she's like she's exhausted she's breathing heavy this is another indication that these dances take so much out of you like you mentioned the haven like the haven shows like it's about the culture but it also shows that these these um aspects of their culture are like 
athletic events you know like yeah. dancing is an athletic event and it is it takes a lot of athleticism it takes a lot of stamina and endurance and even for very short dance because your bodies are always constantly moving in these dances it just takes a lot out of you and so she's there um on a balcony and she's just breathing heavy she's exhausted and like the rain is falling and then that's like one of the quiet the really quiet moments of the film where she's just like like you you talked about it's a moment of healing um and it is i, I read it as a, it's a moment of healing and it's a moment of release for her because the dance is also about release mm-hmm. I, th- I think perhaps of any not only the anger and the sadness but i think of maybe any guilt she could have had mm. about about giving up her culture to become a performer for these mm-hmm. um, these tourists these these concerts <laughs> so, but the, i have to i have to, um, to copy shuri in uh in black fantasy she's like hey my favorite colonizer but it's kind of the same it's kind of the same thing you know like you you feel you you for some people they could feel like they're betraying their culture and their their people by becoming an entertainer for these people who've commodified their culture for for their own entertainment like they'll only be there for a short time and go back home to their lives while anything any if any well the effects of that and the consequences of that stay with the people who have to stay and live on these islands so there's a whole there's so much that a lot of people who if they're not from like cultures like Tahiti are from a culture where tourism is considered a main um import and export like there's a lot of things that come along with that emotionally so this one scene is very sharp I think it I this is how I read read everything into the scene but there's so much to it and um and then you have the guy come up and he's apologizing and i'm like dude nobody don't wants to hear you go away um <laughs> yes. so, like the, and so like the film kind of ends with her um after she's had this um this moment for herself she it shows this very beautiful scene at the end where she's now stepping in place of her ancestors and the chief and she's number training the future generations of dancers you know she's tr- she's showing um a little girl that dance and it's a very beautiful parallel to the flashback scenes that she had and it's like now she's the teacher so talk a bit about that and then also when the film was done um like when you showed it to like moana and um i i want to pronounce her um, Hima, like what were their reactions to that so talk about the the whole theme of like teaching the future generations and then what they thought of the film when you showed it yeah it's um the teaching of the future generation is something that I saw a lot in, in Tahiti. The, the, the dance groups span all ages. Mm. It, it's a, it's a place where, yeah, elders as well as youths gather. And they, um, the people that I talk to, they tell me a bit of the history of how at one point, not a lot of young people wanted to get into the dance. But then recently there's been a resurgence to do that, to reconnect with their, their roots, especially, you know, a lot of people like Nahima who traveled around the world mm. and realized how amazing and beautiful Tahiti is. T- Tahiti is. And it really is. It's, it's incredible. It's an incredible place. And so when they return, they, they have that desire to, to reconnect with, with their roots. And so that's really what inspired that. Um, last scene. Uh, and he mentioned something else. <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry, sometimes I tend to do it. Sometimes I go on a bit too long in my comments. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. You, you mentioned so much. I'm so happy about you sharing all the things that you see and inter- your interpretations because I'm just like, yes, that's exactly what I, yes, 100%. <laughs> yeah um no, i talked a bit about the sadness um like after the anger and the healing yeah. layers, at least I, I mentioned the sadness in the in the film because she is like sad as like i said anger and sadness can come together but there's also like this sense of guilt and uh, with yes, regards to yes. losing connection to her culture and um and her and her people and also feeling possibly isolated because she's the one that's come to this revelation and her other friends don't feel that the same way that she does yeah, that's that's possibly yeah one of the and that, that was definitely influenced by Nahima's story as well. Um, she mentioned to me how in in the group where it's more about um, 
performing for trying trying to bring Ori Tahiti to the global stage and making it more of a globally recognized show. Um, in that group, she mentioned that so for the for the for the Heva, there are many components to it, right? Most of it is group competition, but there is one part of the competition that is um, the solo dancers. So each group chooses one um, woman to compete and one man to compete. And in the, I'll just say, I'll just call it the more modern group. The more modern group, it's it's more like here where people, dancers were like, I want to be the representative of our group. Mm -hmm. And then someone's like, I want to be the representative. So it's more individualized and competitive whereas in her her traditional um the group that she eventually went to to uh, reconnect with her roots it's more communal it's more community based no one would dare you're not supposed you don't people don't just step out and say i want to do this Hmm. it's the group somehow of arise at the consensus like oh you know what we think we think you should do it yeah you know so she was chosen by the group she didn't she didn't say i want to do it she, she was chosen by the group and so I, I, it's more about yeah though that those two um contrasting experiences of hers and how individualism is if is influencing their culture too right for better and worse and um yeah so that's that's just it's it's funny it's because i feel like as we talk i i realize that the film is made up of all these little tiny moments that are and each little tiny moment is has a huge backstory behind yeah. it based on these other things that i've experienced and, and heard of and i, I don't know if you know, you can get all of that in those little moments, but um, maybe just even a hint of it is, you know, if the audience gets a hint of it, I, I feel very satisfied. So. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> um, so, so what were their reactions to the film? Like, watching That's the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Nahima, yeah, we've, we've become such good friends. So it was, the film was... Uh, premiered in Tribeca. Mm. And so she actually flew out to New York from Tahiti oh. um, for, yeah, for the premiere. So we got to spend quite a bit of time together and watch on the big screen together. She had already seen it before that, but, you know, it's different to see it mm. with your, your choreographer, right? So, uh, you know, ha- this whole festival run, it's been great, but it's also it's also not as satisfying as I thought it would be in the sense that I realized sitting with Nahima and watching it and like seeing her feeling proud of the film, that is so much more meaningful than everything else, you know? Yeah. And that makes me realize that maybe I, I've been I've been contemplating about this, about going back to Tahiti to just to show the film. Um, maybe at the next Heva um, for 2023, because at the end of the day, the film is for them. Like I said, yes. it's, it's to reciprocate what they share with me. You should um, go back and show it to them. I think they <laughs> love it, especially for the younger kids too, because um, as an animator, like, is it, now that you're an animator, <laughs> it's another, <laughs> I think it's a way to show them that this this is just another avenue, another method that they, for the younger generation to show like this is a way that they can also honor their culture. This is also another way that they can um to to honor their own people and to show like this is because like art is also a very big part of uh, Tahitian and Polynesian mm-hmm. um culture and, and Pacifica culture. So like you you could be like this is also for you guys can also show your art. You know like this is how you meld the dancing or the music and the visual art. Today. Yeah, Nahima and I t- talked about. You know, if I was to go back, it'd be cool if I like, you know, ran some animation classes to give back. And yeah, that that sounds 
yeah, I, I'm super into that. She, she's so down. She's so great. She's so down with any, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, that's the Tahitian attitude. They're always just so down to mm. collaborate artistically without any kind of like, what is it for? You know, what, what, how much you're going to get paid or like what, what kind of reputation it's no, it's just art for art's sake is it's assumed by them. You know, it's just, so I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, I, one of the last things I want to talk a bit about is um just so like we, we've talked about how the film is about um colonization and colonialism. So, which is a political, um, a, it is, a, it is politics. It's a political aspect of the film. So um, when you were researching the film and researching the culture and the dance and everything, what were the, what's the, I, what's the word I want to say? Um, did any, I like, like you said, like um, she, she, she talked about her own personal um, struggles with connecting to her culture. Were, were there any discussions with regard to the politics of like just regaining their own cult, they're just regaining their own ancestry away from um, the commercialization of it? Like what, what was the kind of discussions that you guys had? Because yeah. that's a very, it's, it's, it's a very nuanced and a very, um, a very subtle aspect of the film, but it's there if people pay attention and it's, and it is the reason for why you changed your um why you decided this is what I want to make the film about. Yeah. Actually it was Mate, the the person who I stayed with, that really the person who told the story of his grandmother that um I, I discussed about colonialism with a lot. He would say that like he spent five years in, in France going to school studying art there. And he would say that he doesn't feel French, you know, he mm. feels Polynesian. He feels more akin with, um, you know, Hawaii and the Samoa, Samoa islands. Like he feels more connected with Polynesia than, than to, to France. Um, and so, yeah, he, it's through talks with him that really shine a light on the complexities of of colonialism of of modern Tahiti because he's also very you know it's it's obvious that he's very educated and you know a lot of his education is from France and mm. he he does live in an absolute beautiful beautiful modern house that has Tahitian designs uh, design elements influence like fused into it he himself is very mixed you know he's chinese tahitian french everything and so to to be able to live with him for for a while for for that period to see how he approaches life in every sense um you know it you see the complexity of how he how colonialism is part of his life but also this anger towards it as well mm. um yeah i don't know if that answers your question and no, i mean it, no it answers it because yeah. like the the even um even the dance that to her dances at the end like i didn't mention this before but the, she did it in the same auditorium where she was performing earlier, she goes back on the same stage mm -hmm. and she performs this truly cultural and truly emotional, truly visceral dance in front of the Taurus, you know, mm -hmm. instead of in front of the same two men who were objectifying her, that mm -hmm. in itself is a, not only a, a statement of rebellion, but it's also a political statement because she's mm -hmm. showing, she's showing the people that are there. This is who we are. This is who my people are. This is who I am. You know, like she's showing this is who this is. This isn't the polished, perfect performance that we perform time again, over and over and over multiple times. You know, like every night they perform the same dance, but for different people. So it's like, yeah. it's kind of lost meaning and sense, but she's like, this is who we are. And that's a political statement. That's an act of rebellion, you know, yeah. be um, because like, this isn't for people who, again who might not understand like for for anyone who's in a culture like that to come out and perform just rawness in front of 
their guests, you know, the tourists. Like that's not what the tourists expected. That's not what no. the tourists yeah. want. That's not what they're paying to see. And it's it's an act of political rebellion. It's a it's a statement, you know, like um like rebellion and political and a political statement isn't everything like drawing up a, a, a just like a long um memorandum or whatever. It's it's an it's just an act of saying like asserting your own identity. And that's what the film happens. And like what you're saying, like it like it's it's a it's a very confusing thing, especially for me. I'm an immigrant. I live in um, mm-hmm. Canada, and like I, I'm always cognizant of the fact that I the land that I live on now, the mm-hmm. land I'm, I call my second home, is a settler a settler colonial estate. You know, it's yeah. on ceded territory. You know, the indigenous people are very much marginalized on their own land. I'm always aware of that. That I am, an, and that's why I. I'm proud to call myself an immigrant, not only because it reminds people and reminds myself that I am from Barbados. I have a own home, which has its own complicated past with slavery and the transatlantic mm-hmm. slave trade, but that I know that I am not of this land. This is not my home, you know? Yeah. So like when I, if I, I do what I can to like uplift like indigenous voices, like on, like on Twitter, like if I see any protests, whatever, I retweet it because this is a way of helping them to let their voices be heard you know and so like film like this is another way of doing that like at relation there's a, a documentary that i saw um oh my gosh why am i drawing a blank in my brain uh, um it's about this um the the senate i, I believe it's a tradition it's an indigenous um native um mm. first nations group and the film is talking about the, this whole complicated past and like how they have to assert their own dominance on their own land, you know, how they have to speak against the um, co- um the colonialists on their own land. They have to say, you're on my property. This is my land, but they, they're they still being, con- they're still in this fight to be recognized as indigenous people on their own land. So like the film like touches on that, like that she's reminding these people that she, that's watching her, you're a tourist, you're a visitor, you're a guest on my own land, but then she's still speaking with a tongue that is not of her people. You know, so it's very complicated and very complex. And like your friend, like, like he has all of that. Like that's all that that's this whole complicated idea of who he is. You know, like so, like so, like you 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 did you did answer the question, and you you I think you you kind of like pay respect to that within the film itself because it's there. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thanks so much. I. Yeah, I I I feel like wanting to make dances as political statements is i don't know it's it's something that i want to keep trying to do Mm. or expressions of the body maybe not just dance but it can be so much more powerful like you said than just words you know um yeah i always it's interesting to hear you describe her how you inter- interpreted her on stage. And I'm so happy about that interpretation. I feel like that's the most generous interpretation you could give me. <laughs> because for me, it was, uh, you know, the, the original objective was just for her to reclaim her own body. Mm. Um, and I was like, oh, should she perform? Should, should she dance her final dance on that stage? It feels so much more like, once again it's for the audience and that's why you never see in her final dance you never see any lens from the audience perspective Mm -hmm. you know you never see like an over the shoulder of the audience or from that view viewpoint it it just stays with her and i almost pretty much ignore the audience (laughs) because i was i I wanted to stay away from that as as much as possible but yeah you know what you're saying the idea of her reclaiming not just her body but the whole stage and even the resort in of itself and i guess that's yeah that's part of what the rain was meant to and the storm was meant to represent as well the drowning of the stage Mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm so happy that that's what you got out of it yeah um so while we wrap as we wrap it now so the last thing i want to ask you is like um how has the film changed your perspective of filmmaking and animation in general but also your um how you perceive yourself now as a filmmaker because like for for a first film and for whether short or feature length or 
um, animated or, or live action, like your first film is says a lot about who you are as a filmmaker. It says a lot about who you want to be as a filmmaker. So what does this film, what do you think this film says about you as a filmmaker? And like, where do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it made me realize I don't want to make another animated film like this. <laughs> <laughs> where I animate everything by myself. I do not want that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it made me realize the most rewarding part of the film was working with uh, the Tahitian community. Mm. It wasn't, you know, the endless nights of animating. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it made me realize that um, even though I love to draw and love to make visual art. It, I think maybe realize a more powerful artistic medium that I'm now exploring is community building. Mm. Um, that has nothing to do with filmmaking really, <laughs> or, or it has to do with storytelling, but in a very different way. There's no, it's nothing to do with this, like creating a product of a film piece and then you know presenting it in these institutions it has nothing to do to do with that is yeah what what the experience taught me is really um wanting to bring that sense that approach to community that i learned in tahiti to carry that with me as not just a filmmaker but as a person you know mm. um that using that medium in, in all parts of my life. And so, yeah, now I've been more um, uh, involved in the, in the climate movement here in, in Vancouver. And that is my medium through which I try to express that. And uh, I mean, I'm still writing my next project, um, but it's going to be like a hybrid of, comics and and that's that's some panels animated but you know with that i still i'm still exploring you know body politics and making political statements with <laughs> narratives of the body great that's yeah. great i can't wait to see what you do next honestly i really can't um thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me way this was great <laughs> yeah thank you so much for telling me all, all about how you interpreted the film and giving so much thought yeah i i really enjoyed this so everyone that was another episode of carolyn talks and this episode i was joined by storyboard artist now animator and filmmaker Wei Li to talk about his short animated film Tahuda which showed at the 2022 Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival. I really love this um, film um, as you hear during my discussion with Wei. I had a lot to say about it um, but it's really good and um, I just I just love the animation style and I love the story and how complex and layered it is and how it talks about Tahitian culture and and also how and as a dancer, the character of Tehuda, like she could reclaim her her own identity as a Tahitian and as a woman and as a dancer um, through this through her dance. And while the film is animated and it's technically fictional, it, it like as he said, his friend y Yahima, like she also had a similar experience. So I just think it's beautiful that we got to see this aspect of Tahitian culture through this medium. And um, I can't wait to see what else way he does because this he I think he has a, a very um unique perspective as a filmmaker so it will be fun to see what he does next and again I thank him so much for taking the time to speak with me about it and congratulations to him for the premiere that was at Tribeca and the screening at um Relation or any and any other screenings he will do in the future thank you way and um, as usual, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at CarrieCNH12, that's C-R-I-E-C-N-H12. You can go to my R3 page, that's A-U-T-H-O-R-Y dot com slash my full name, Carolyn Hines, to find all of my published writing. And as well, and they recently started to add links to the podcast and YouTube channel is there as well. And for my YouTube channel, you can go to YouTube.com slash 
the at symbol carolyn underscore heinz i now have my own personalized handle yay me to see um the video version of this interview with way there as well as other interviews that i've done for real asian tiff south by southwest sundance my interviews uh, for the app virtual round tables with black creators from around the world um, in the film and television industries and um i think that's it oh and i i always forget to mention this but i'm also a co-host of saturday night cypher this is a weekly um live tweet event which takes place every saturday night at 10 p.m eastern where we live tweet um animated comp films and tv shows and, and live action, of course, films and TV shows in with sci-fi elements are within the sci-fi genre from around the world. It's so much fun. Um, just use the hashtag Saturday Night Sci-Fi to find our announcements and you can even read our threads that we've done. It's been great. And um, until the next episode of Carolyn Talks, everyone stay safe. Bye. <laughs>